Good morning, church. Pastor Trevor here. It's a joy once again to be in worship with you. I believe that God has a word for uh, you, for me, for uh, our loved ones, our family, our friends. And so I want, want to invite you to share this morning's service. Either text the link or click the share button and it'll go straight to your Facebook page. Uh, but that way, we are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with just a simple click. Um, We've got an incredible service uh, in store. We're, we're going to ex experience Holy Communion here in a second and the sacrament of that. Uh, I've got a buddy of mine, Reverend Sam Robbins, uh, sharing a word with us. Um, I'm just excited. The worship music's going to be incredible. Uh, but as we kind of slow down and prepare ourselves for worship, I invite you to take a deep breath, let it out slowly, and let's go to God in prayer. Merciful and gracious God, we gather yet again another Sunday. We gather, we gather digitally all over, opening our homes and our lives to you, saying, God, we want more of you. God, we need more of you. So God, fill this hour, hour with your presence. Let us experience your love and grace just poured out on us. Wherever we're worshiping, let the Holy Spirit be present. That we wouldn't just kind of consume this worship service, but that it would do something to us, that it would transform us inside, and that we might faithfully follow you into who you're calling us to be this week. We pray all this in your son's name, amen. songs be a sign we are here for you we are here for you. let your breath come from heaven fill our hearts with your life we are here for you
hey, we say it every week, but uh, we truly believe that God hears us, that God journeys with us in life, and that uh, God the Father just wants to hear from his children. And so we as a community of faith believe that there's something powerful when uh, not just one one person prays, but when the community gathers and lifts up prayers to God, that there's something powerful, unexplainable that happens. And so we're going to go into a time of prayer. I invite you to share a name, uh, a circumstance, a situation that maybe you give thanks to God for, and we just want to say hallelujah, and, and God, you're awesome. We, we experience your joy in this uh, but for some of us, maybe there's something, a situation in life that we say, God, we need you. Where are you? God, bring your healing. God, bring your presence. And so we want to pray with you in those moments too. Um, so I invite you, like I said, to share a name uh, in the comments below, and we as a community will be praying with you. But with that in mind, would you pray with me? Gracious God, we know that you're good. We know that you're at work. We, we, we have many things to give thanks for, many ways that, in, in, that, that we give praise, and, and it's through the music that we're reminded to sing of your glories. And so we say thank you. Thank you that your mercies are new every day, that they just rain on us, and God, we ask for eyes to see it that we'd be reminded as we see them that you are with us in all of this. But all all around life, in our own lives, in our personal journeys, and in our family, and with our friends, and across the world, there are so many places, God, that we, we want to see you at work. We need you. And so we, we give voice to those, and, and we speak your presence even now asking for a miracle, asking for something so crazy that only you could get the glory for doing it. We pray for your presence, your peace, your joy, your healing. You're the great physician. We pray for your confidence, your boldness. We, we pray for doors to open and doors to close, that people might follow you, that they might know the direction you're pulling them. We pray for ourselves, God, and even ways that we don't know, even ways that we don't know how to give voice to, we pray. For it says in the scripture, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our, on our groans and our moans, those things that we can't even explain, that we don't have the words to, to say about God, we lift those to you too. And we pray in faith and the hope for things unseen. We pray in boldness, trusting that you'll be at work. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are freed. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see. All the things that Friend who claims us Cools the heat and slows the pace God it is who speaks and names us Knows our being touches space Making space within our thinking Lifting shades to show the sun Raising courage when we're shrinking Finding scope for faith begun (laughs) 
In the spirit, let us travel open to each other's pain. Let our lives and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for our deepest dream. There's a time for heart to care. In the spirit's lively scheming, there is always room to spare.
Hey, Good News Church. My name is Sam, and I'm so grateful to be with y'all here today. Uh, to be honest, this is a pretty cool experience for me. Like Trevor, I grew up uh, with a dad who was a United Methodist pastor. And so growing up, I would always see my dad go and preach at some of his friends' churches. And, um, and so when I got into ministry, I envisioned myself doing that too. And today, uh, thanks to, to your pastor and, and thanks to your church, I get to do exactly that. I get to preach at a buddy's church. So this is pretty cool for me, but, um, but yeah, thank you for, for letting me be here with you guys today. I want us to just go ahead and begin today with our scripture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about what is, in my opinion, one of the most overlooked virtues of them all. Today we're going to be talking about gentleness. And our scripture for today has everything to say about what it looks like to be gentle. So if you've got your Bibles with me, you can go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John. We're going to be in John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. It's a verse many of you may be familiar with. This is what it says. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teach her. This woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. As we think about this topic of gentleness today, I wanna to begin with a question. When you think about gentleness, when I say the word gentleness, do you ever apply it to yourself? That's our first point for today, is that we have to be gentle with ourselves. A part of gentleness that I think we fail to consider sometimes is gentleness with self. But in this story, Jesus models this masterfully. Let me set the stage a bit. Jesus is a rabbi and he's teaching. And when a rabbi was teaching, that meant it was time to shut up and listen. To interrupt a rabbi was something they would have considered profoundly inappropriate and rude. But what makes things exponentially worse is the reason they've interrupted him. You see, this whole situation that they bring to Jesus is a big trap that they're trying to lay for him. They bring this woman to Jesus and they ask whether or not they should stone her. Well, here's why this is a trap. Levitical law says that if a couple is caught in adultery, they must both be put to death. Now, an important side note here, uh, scripture says that she was caught in adultery and yet the man, Notice that the man is nowhere to be found in our passage, even though the law that they're referring to emphasizes that all parties involved face the penalty. Again, the reason this is important is because it shows us yet again, this is all just a means of trapping Jesus. So again, here's, here's the trap. If Jesus answers their question and he says not to stone her, well, then he is breaking Mosaic law. They have a way to get him. But if Jesus says, yes, yeah, go ahead, stone her. Well, then he's kind of going back on all that love and forgiveness and compassion stuff that he's been spouting off. You see, it's all a game to the Pharisees. And Jesus knows this. He has every right in this situation to get upset, I think. He has every right in this situation to be livid, to freak out, and if it were us, we might understandably react just that way. 
We might respond with anger and aggression. These people trying to to catch Jesus, but that's not what he does. Instead, he stops and he begins to write something on the ground. Now, many people have debated what Jesus wrote that day. This is one of those big biblical mysteries. It's it's one of my go-to when I get to heaven questions. I don't know why it fascinates me so much, but, but regardless, that's not the point. The point is that in the midst of this incredibly high stakes, intense situation, Jesus takes a moment to pause. He disengages both them and their question. He takes a break. And I think that when it comes to being gentle with ourselves, sometimes this is what we ought to do. There was a New York Times study uh, conducted recently on the American workforce. And I want to read you an excerpt from that study. This is what it says. A new and growing body of multidisciplinary research shows that strategic renewal including daytime workouts, short afternoon naps, longer sleep hours, more time away from the office, longer, more frequent vacations, actually boosts productivity, job performance, and of course, health. When we're under pressure, however, most of us experience the opposite impulse, to push harder rather than rest. This may explain why a recent survey by Harris Interactive found that Americans left an average of 9.2 vacation days unused. Friends, we are bad at pausing. We are bad at stopping and listening and taking a moment to write in the sand. For whatever reason, we so often fail to give ourselves a moment in the midst of stress to be gentle we launch ourselves straight into whatever conflict comes our way, but, but how often does that make things worse? We need to be people who give ourselves a minute to breathe and to listen, to disconnect from a world that will always be stressful and demanding. And 2020, in some ways, has forced us to do exactly that, to pause, And although the circumstances that require this aren't what we wish they were, it's in this season that I've really seen how true this New York Times study is. We're not great at pausing and listening. But friends, Christ calls us to gentleness, and that includes being gentle with self. You know, in our passage, Jesus is showing us exactly what that looks like. He's just been essentially publicly insulted. But he doesn't respond with aggression the way that many of us might. He doesn't get hateful or vitriolic. He responds instead gently by kneeling down and writing in the sand. This matters because what Jesus is doing is showing them that he is disengaging their wrong intentioned question. He's taking a moment to breathe and to hear. For those of us who struggle with gentleness, sometimes this is all we can do. Because if we're being honest today, gentleness is hard. Gentleness is really difficult. True gentleness, Christ-like gentleness, is a balancing act. That's our second point for today. Gentleness does not condemn or condone. Again, I want us to take a minute and note the incredible balance of Jesus' gentleness here. He neither condemns nor condones the sin they've accused this woman of. He tells her at the end of the scripture uh, passage for today, none of them condemned you and neither do I. He expresses mercy and gentleness, but at the same time, he doesn't ignore the sin that she's committed. See, this is also an, an important point. Gentleness is not apathy towards sin. At the end of our verse, Jesus says, go and sin no more. It's an incredible balance. It's extraordinary. He neither condemns nor condones. You know, sometimes I think we have a tendency to jump to one extreme or the other. 
We see someone doing something that we believe is wrong and we do one of two things. We attack them, we hatefully condemn them, we throw the Bible at them and say, look, look what the Bible says, you're doing it wrong. But when we do that, we're, we're acting a lot like the Pharisees that approached Jesus with Mosaic law. And frankly, that's rarely very successful in changing people's hearts. The other thing we have a tendency to do is to use gentleness as an excuse for doing nothing. We say, yeah, I, I know that what is in front of me is wrong. I know that it's sin or injustice, but I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna do anything or get involved because it's not my place. We condemn or condone. But gentleness is neither of those things. Jesus doesn't do either of those things. Instead, he gently points people back to truth and holiness. Frank Clark an American politician who served under Calvin Coolidge once said, criticism like rain should be gentle enough to nourish a man's growth without destroying his roots. I love that. And isn't that what Jesus does in our passage so beautifully? Gentleness like this is a delicate balance to strike, but if we're gonna be the people that God has called us to be, this is how we've got to act. This is how we've, we've got to be when it comes to holding our brothers and sisters in Christ accountable. I read a story recently about St. Francois de Soleil, better known as St. Francis. St. Francis is the, the patron saint of gentleness. And he was known for his incredible innate ability to walk this fine line, to strike this balance. A woman once wrote to St. Francis and she said that she had given up prayer entirely. She said that every time she prayed, she would get distracted. She would, uh, she would quickly lose focus and, and she felt like the sin of her inattention had left her with no hope. So she figured the only thing that she could do was to quit praying, to give up. And I love what St. Francis writes in his response letter to her. This is what he says. He says, if the heart wanders or is distracted, bring it back to the point quite gently. And even if you did nothing during the whole hour, but bring your heart back and place it again and again and again in our Lord's presence, though it went away from you every time, your hour would be well employed. I love that. And I think that that is a great model for us. I think that is the exact kind of gentle balance that Jesus shows us. St. Francis doesn't shame her for giving up prayer, but he also doesn't tell her it's okay. Instead, he nudges her in the right direction, encouraging her to be gentle with herself in the process. St. Francis has a wonderful quote that I love. He says, nothing is so strong as gentleness, nothing so gentle as real strength. Friends, gentleness is a strong characteristic. We too often associate it with weakness, but, but it's far from that. Gentleness is, is real strength. When we are truly gentle, we can accomplish incredible things for the kingdom of God. Gentleness does not condemn or condone. Gentleness convicts. That's our last point for today. Gentleness convicts. It changes and softens hearts. As I was writing this sermon, I, I tried to think about the gentlest human being that I'd ever known. And for me, it was pretty easy. It's Willie Fay. Willie Fay was my great grandmother. She was actually married to a United Methodist pastor who served in our conference. Well, I want to share with you a story that happened when Willie Fay was in her early 80s, a crazy story. When my great grandmother, Willie Fay, was in her early 80s, she was walking into a grocery store in Fort Worth when she was kidnapped. She was held at gunpoint by a couple. They threw her in their SUV. They took her to the mall and they went around with her wallet and her purse and they spent all of her cash. They maxed out all of her credit cards. 
while the woman went and, and spent all of Willie Fay's money, the man stayed holding her hostage in this car. She began to, to talk to the man as they sat there. She asked him questions about his life. She told him about her faith. At first, she said that he was very agitated, but slowly and surely, he began to soften. I think what happened that day is her gentleness softened him just enough to get him to talk back. And so they began to talk about a variety of things. They talked about God, about how her husband was a preacher. They talked about their favorite hymns from childhood. They talked about their lives, all while he held a gun in his hand. Well, eventually the woman got back from shopping and, and she told the man that they should get rid of Willie Fay, that they should, quote, dispose of her in a field. But the man refused. He apparently started putting up this huge fight. He demanded they take her back to the area they picked her up. The woman argued back. She said, we can't do that. She'll go to the police. We'll get caught. We'll go to jail. But the man was adamant. And so they ended up dropping Willie Fay off at the La Madeline on Camp Bowie in Fort Worth. She walked inside uh, the restaurant. She was visibly shaken, so much so that the manager uh, walked up to her, asked her, ma'am, are you okay? They called my grandfather who came and got her. They called the police. You know, as strange as this might sound, I think that story has profound parallels with our scripture. Willie Fay finds herself in this life or death situation and through gentleness, this virtue that she finds in her relationship with Jesus Christ, a heart is softened and changed. And isn't that exactly what happens in our scripture? Jesus finds himself in this intense life or death situation and his gentleness changes hearts. It changes the hearts of the crowd that calls for execution and I'm sure it changed the heart of the woman that they sought to kill. Gentleness does not condemn or condone, it convicts. And friends, this has got to be us. Now I pray that you don't ever find yourself in this drastic of a situation ever. But look around. Every day we come face to face with conflict. We live in an increasingly divided world and with the 2020 election inching closer, I don't imagine that that's suddenly gonna go away. Y'all, we are called by Christ and we have got to be the change. We have to be people who choose unity and respect over vitriol and division. And we start that process by prioritizing this often overlooked stop on our road to sanctification. We do it by being gentle with each other because gentleness convicts. Gentleness has the power to change and soften hearts. And gentleness also has the, the, the incredible power of making our Lord and Savior known. It helps us to share our faith as much as it helps us with anything else. I love uh, the scripture first, from 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. It's a well-known scripture. This is what it says. It says, but in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. Verse 15 is, is a very famous verse. It's, it's a famous verse that's often used when talking about evangelism and the sharing and defense of our faith. But many times people leave out verse 16. Do it with gentleness and reverence. We can't leave that verse out because the deepest forms of change happen when we are gentle, just like the writer says. I have the... The, the pleasure to serve here at White's Chapel as the pastor to college and young adults. And last summer, our student ministry folks, our senior pastors and I got to uh, take a bunch of seniors down to your neck of the woods. We got to take our seniors for a couple of days to Austin. 
And, and at one point during the trip, they, they got the opportunity to ask any question they wanted. And I was blown away by the depth of their questions. And I was also surprised that so many of their questions were about sharing their faith, sharing their beliefs, and how to do it. I got the sense from several of our seniors that they feel uncomfortable sharing their faith. And frankly, it's something I, I've seen with a lot of young people. And I think the reason for that, the reason that I heard from them and the reason that I've seen is that they've, they've seen that aggressive nature that some Christians have adopted. They've seen people who scream and condemn. They've seen people who condone and do nothing. And they don't wanna be associated with either of those things. They're afraid that when they tell people that they're Christians, that, that people are gonna think that they're hateful or vitriolic. When the truth is, when people hear that we're Christians, it should make them think the exact opposite. It should conjure images of gentleness and kindness and love, of concern for the least of these. Friends, we have an important job to do. We have got to change this perception because there is work to do. There are broken hearts and broken people all over and we have got to be the kind of people whose journeys intersect with the needs of our world. And I believe that gentleness, this strange little virtue, may be one of our most powerful tools in the transformation of this world. Now, maybe that transformation comes in the form of being a little gentler on ourselves by allowing ourselves to take a moment when we feel attacked or insulted or overwhelmed or overstressed to just pause in the midst of the chaos and listen, to take a moment and write in the sand. Maybe that transformation comes in the way that we love others without condemning or condoning. Maybe it looks like gently pulling our heart back into prayer the way that St. Francis instructed. Or maybe, maybe it looks like somebody who sees gentleness in us and can't help but be transformed themselves. Maybe it looks like a hard-hearted man choosing not to hurt a gentle old woman. Friends, gentleness is more than some passive virtue. Gentleness is a holy calling on each one of our lives. It is our means of taking this hurting world and beginning to heal it. Alleluia. Amen. Well, it's the first Sunday of the month, and we're traditionally we do communion uh, on the first Sunday. And so we're, I'm going to invite you to pause the video real quick and go find... Uh, bread and some juice or something that could uh, be the body and blood of Christ for you. We come to the table to, to be reminded of that gentleness that Sam spoke about. To be reminded of Christ's gentleness, Christ's love for us. To be reminded of a new way of living a way based in who Christ is and the, the, the model that Christ gave us. So with it, uh, that in mind, I invite you to pause and to confess the ways that we don't live like Christ. Would you pray with me? Merciful and gracious God, we confess that we failed to be an obedient church. We failed to love our neighbor as ourselves, we failed to love you. Forgive us, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news that Christ died for you, for me, for all of us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for and towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. It was on the night in which he gave himself up for us that he took bread and gave thanks for it and broke it. He said, take Eat, for this is my body, broken for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. 
And then when the supper was over, he took the cup and again gave thanks for it, blessed it, and said, drink from this all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, a new way of relating with God. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. So it's in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, that we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving. That we say, God, we want to be just like you. That we want to be Christ-like. Would you pray with me? Merciful and gracious God, I pray that um, you would take these everyday elements of bread and juice and make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that as we take them, we might experience your presence. We might be filled with your love and grace. That we would be reminded of your gentleness towards us. As we take them, God, embolden us in our faith. That we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your Holy Spirit. That we might get to work bringing about your kingdom here on earth. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Are you hurting, broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness.
Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Well, thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. I, my hope and my prayer is that you experience Christ that you experience Christ crucified and dead and risen again, that you would experience the power of Christ, that the, the power that says darkness and evil have no power over us anymore. That you experience Christ's love and gentleness. This week as you go, go to share that gentleness with yourself, with your family and friends, with your neighbors. Go to be the body of Christ. Go in the name of the Father, Son, in the Holy Spirit. Amen.